Well, we're still in Genesis this morning, and we're going to be looking at chapters 10 and 11. And as I've been studying this, I've realized that there's a a temptation that I've faced as I've been studying Genesis, especially from chapter 3 through, well, now 11. And that is, it's, it's easy to look at these men and women. It's easy to go back and read about their lives, and particularly their failures, and shake my head and say, shame on you. It's easy to look back and say, how could you be so foolish? How can you be so blatantly disregarding, disobeying, and not trusting God? Well, I think this is the wrong attitude to have, and I've had to be repenting of it as I've been studying Genesis, because if we're honest with ourselves, if people were watching our lives and recording the events of our lives, other people will come alongside and say, shame on us. They would see the great failures that we have daily and weekly. These are recorded for us to be a lesson that we're all failing because we've all sinned against God. What we need to do is learn to trust God. And this morning, it's, we're going to look at how the builders of Babel, especially, did not trust God. Now let's think about these builders of Babel. More particularly, let's think about how we are like them. The three sins, pride, fear, and disobedience. How are we like them in their pride, their fear, and their disobedience? Let's ask some questions. How do we try to build ourselves up to make a name for ourselves. The sin is pride. How are we prideful like these Babylonians, or how these builders of Babel, and notice here their pride is that they're uniting to make a name together, as opposed to God in His name. I think our sin is worse because we try to make a name not just opposed to God, but we try to make a name opposed to one another. We want a greater name than everyone else instead of having a unified name. How are we like them? Well, let's ask some questions. Do you put yourself forward for every opportunity so that others will think more of you? How do you serve? What is your motivation in serving others? What is your motivation in always taking the next promotion? What is your motivation in always taking that opportunity to work more, to serve more? Is it that others will think more of you, that you will gain a great reputation? Or is it to glorify God, to serve the church, to respond to God's great love for us? Now, I don't want to pretend that this is an easy answer because we're all sinners. And I pray that the church is also all saints. And so we have mixed motivations. The goal here is to get rid of those motivations that are selfish, fight against that desire to do things because they're selfish motivations. We don't stop serving because we have selfish motivations. No, we intentionally fight against those selfish motivations and always think intentionally, I am going to do this for the glory of God. Do you boast of yourself? Do you like to tell others about your achievements? Do you feel the need to be recognized for what you do, for what you've accomplished? Do you need others to recognize your own greatness? Well, there's a couple of different problems here. Maybe you don't receive enough attention from your spouse. Maybe you don't receive enough praise for your good work. But regardless of those problems, your problem is that you want to boast in yourself. And as Christians, we're supposed to boast only in Christ. We are supposed to boast in Him. Whenever we're seeking to find acceptance from others, praise from others, when we're seeking to get acclimates and we're seeking to get praise, we need to tell others what we've done so they think more of us. That's evidence of an identity crisis. That's evidence of you not being firmly found and based upon who Christ is what he's done for you, and who he's made you today. See, friend, you're a son or daughter of Christ, if you believe in him. 
That's all the security you need. That's all the identity marker you need. That's the greatest comfort. That should make you content. If you find yourself needing to tell others about who you are or what you've done, and you're a Christian, challenge yourself this morning. Is that evidence? That I am not content in being a son or daughter of Christ alone? Is that evidence that my foundation is my worth in this world rather than the Savior's purchase of my soul in heaven? Another way I, I, I fear or I find myself wanting to build myself up is when others speak ill of me. When someone attacks me, I want to go out and attack back. I want to go out and defend myself. Now let me give a very personal, very maybe complicated illustration. Before I came to Jefferson Park, your leaders asked me how to respond to false accusations and misrepresentations that were being said about you as a church. Well, I put on my theological jacket and I gave a very clear, bold answer. You need to not respond. You need to wait upon God to protect you. You need to wait upon God to, rec to, to vindicate your name. You are not a defender of your name, Jefferson Park, when you're falsely accused or misrepresented. You're supposed to wait upon God and trust Him in His timing. Then I came. Now I'm with you. Now we're together. And I'm being, or I have been, accused and falsely represented against you. And you know what my first inclination was? Oh, we're going to go get this. <laughs> <clears throat> I say that because when people falsely accuse you, when people misrepresent you, it's counterintuitive to do nothing. It's not your first inclination. It's a very difficult thing to not do. It's difficult not to go defend yourself. But I'm very thankful for the leaders of the church that when I wanted to go defend my name, defend our name, they reminded me of the advice I gave. That was the clear biblical prescription. It's difficult. Being a Christian, being a faithful Christian, it's difficult. This isn't the easy street. This is the street of redemption. This is the narrow way. This is the way that we deny ourselves and take upon our cross and glorify God. Friends, when people accuse you wrongly, when people lie about you, think of your, your Savior. When going to the cross, didn't say a word. He didn't correct. He trusted God. God to be the one who would protect his name, vindicate him, and God will be glorified. When people misrepresent you personally, when people lie about you, don't be so bothered with your reputation and your name. Be worried. Be most concerned about the name of Jesus Christ and how you can glorify him in the midst of that difficulty, in the midst of that suffering. That is how we relate to their pride. We boast of ourselves. We seek to defend ourselves. We put ourselves forward for praise. The second way, referring to the fear. How do we protect a sphere of our lives from being under God's rule? They refuse to be scattered because of fear. They refuse to fulfill the creation mandate. Go fill all the earth. Because of fear. Let's just jump straight to the, create, the equivalent of the cre Christian creation mandate, and that is the Great Commission. We are all called to go proclaim the gospel. We are all called to evangelize, to teach the world everything Christ taught us, and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are all called to proclaim the gospel. What keeps you from proclaiming the gospel? It's fear. It's fear of man. It's fear of being mocked. It's fear of being thought as less. Uh, it's fear of being thought of as inferior in the world. Friend, 
There isn't a special gift of evangelism. There's a special calling upon all of us. It's not just a few that Jesus Christ said, I have given you all authority. It's to the entire church. It's to every saint. Do not let fear keep you from fulfilling the great commission of Christ. Other things that we're fearful of letting God have control over are money. We like to protect our finances. We like to protect what we need, think we might need for retirement or for a rainy day. We don't let God have sovereign rule over how we spend our money, over what we give. We need to be letting God look into our checkbook. Let him see what we're spending, what we're spending it on. And let scripture or other brothers and sisters give us good godly correction in what we spend our money on and how we spend it. My worst is time. I'm selfish with my time. I have a hard time letting go of time. I want my time for my things. God's sovereign over every second that I possess, that I get to enjoy. We cannot be selfish with what God has given us. The other way we, we might be fear, fearful, or we may question God's goodness. That is the root problem here. We're questioning God's faithfulness and trustworthy with our time, our money, with his ability to save sinners while we evangelize. Do you trust God is good to you today? Do you find yourself daydreaming about a life that you wish you could have? The life you think you should have? Do you find yourself thinking, if only I had this? What you're doing there is questioning God's sovereignty and what he gives you and how he gives it to you. If we believe God is sovereign, if we believe God is ultimately the orchestrator of all things, he has put you where you are to do what you're doing. When you question that, when you want more, when you want something else, you're questioning God. You're questioning his goodness and his provision and his faithfulness. We must learn to be content in what God is doing to us and for us. Finally, look at the disobedience. Do we try to overstep God's predetermined boundaries, just like the builders of Babel sought to build up into heaven? One of the clearest ways this can happen is in families. Wives and husbands, are you faithfully following your, your, your prescription in Scripture? Husbands, to lead your home. To love your wife as Christ loved the church. Wives are respecting and submitting to your husbands. These are practically the easiest ones to overstep. We must be mindful always of the sin that's seeking to destroy us. Children, your role is to honor and obey your parents. Your temptation is going to try to undermine, overthrow your parents. Your temptation is to try to push them to the limits to see how much freedom they can give you. Don't do that. Trust your good parents and their good wisdom to help you know how to live the life that's going to most glorify God. Honor and obey them. They know what's best for you. 